How to Become Happier. That's our text nation. I'm Fred Fishkin, and I'm happy to welcome back author and New Yorker staff writer, Adam Gopnik. Hi, Adam. Hey, Fred. Wonderful to be back with you. Well, great to see you again. The last time we chatted about a, a year ago, you had a, a new book out titled The Real Work on the Mystery of Mastery. I loved it. And now a little blue book with the title, All That Happiness Is. Some look, look, Fred, look, what a good, look what a good little author I am. I have a year. <laughs> it's even, uh, you know, this is, this is really wonderful, uh, Adam. So uh, you're really upending, I think, the way many people are living their lives today with, with some of the words in here. Give us a, an overview. Well, that's nice of you to say, Fred. Um, the, it's, a, it's a little book, not even 75 pages, and it was um, came together out of a commencement address I gave in Canada a few years ago, and then a couple of short pieces I wrote that I thought all kind of belong together because they're subject to one simple idea. And that is that we, in, in our lives and in our kids' lives, we see two different pursuits. One is the pursuit of accomplishment, and the other the pursuit of achievement. Um, and both together are paths towards what the founding fathers promised us, the pursuit of happiness, but in very different ways. Um, and I'm taking the side of accomplishment against achievement. Okay, what do I mean by that distinction? By accomplishment, I mean all the things that we do that are in some way interdirected, that we do for the sheer pleasure of doing them. We do in some deep sense, Fred, because we can't help but do them. I give the simple example and in my experience, almost everybody has an example in their lives. I give the simple example of when I was 12 years old, I sat on the bed in my bedroom in Montreal, struggling with a $40 folk guitar to learn the chords of Beatles songs. Um, I had to do it myself, stretch and bend my fingers painfully around the, the fretboard and on the steel strings until finally, after a week's constant effort, I could play three chords, a G, a D, and a C for the record. Um, and yet, though I'm obviously not a professional musician or any kind of musician, that week, those weeks, those years of learning guitar are the foundation, really, for everything I've done since. They were the source of the inner poise, if you like, of the um, sensed uh, uh, confidence that has allowed me to do everything else that matters to me in life. And as I say, when I um, interview people, I talk to people like you, uh, about it, almost everybody has an instant uh, response. I was talking to a wonderful Scottish poet um, not long ago, and his guitar chords were origami. You know, and as a poor working class kid in Dundee, Scotland, he taught himself origami. He's not an origami expert, he's a poet. And yet, in every poem he writes, there's an origami elephant of a kind. And against that, Fred, and forgive me for going on, but I want to give you the basic, the kind of the blueprint of the book. It, because it's simple. The, against that, I talk about achievement. Achieve, by achievement, I mean all the outer directed things that we're instructed to do, and that particularly our kids are instructed to do. Get the next grade, get into the next select university. Once you're in the select university, get into the select law school or graduate school or business school. And we drive ourselves and our children forward on this kind of rat race or rat maze, if you like, of achievement where the achievements tend to be empty in themselves. They don't supply that beautiful sense of the flow. They don't su supply us with that feeling of absorption that accomplishment does. And so we live in a society dominated, I think, Fred, by the tyranny of achievement, the constant drive to achieve. And against that, I want to welcome people. I want to um, uh, emphasize and endorse the, um, the far more uh, uh, psychologically significant power of accomplishment. You know, what we seek in life are those moments of flow, those moments when we transcend ourselves by escaping ourselves into some other system. If there's a key to happiness, if there's one way to define what happiness is, it lies exactly in those moments of absorption. And in my view, those moments are driven forward by our pursuit of accomplishments. You know, there there was the the Gallup World Happiness Report that came out yes. uh, very recently. It showed the U.S. has dropped to twenty uh, third yes. in the list of happiest countries. It's even worse for young people, I think. So, mm -hmm. what do, what do we learn from that? That we're we're doing something wrong, I guess. <laughs> we're doing something wrong, and I don't want to be you know I don't want to be a slave of the single explanation. There's all kinds of things that we need to reform in our 
society, um, obviously, and people will tell you that um, the tyranny of achievement is also met by the uh, tyranny of the smartphone, uh, which uh, tends to put our kids in another kind of hamster wheel, literally very often of constant scrolling to find the next uh, doom laden or socially fraught uh, activity. And exactly, that's a very good example, though, in some, though it's not test driven, but uh, scrolling as against doing is a very good comparison in, in a lot of ways. When you set out to master something, as in my, uh, discussed in my previous book, the, the, you mentioned, Fred, the real work on the mystery of mastery. When you set out to master something, uh, you're um, actively engaged in it. It's not a passive activity. You've got to master the origami with your fingers. You've got to master the guitar with your hands. If you're learning to sew, all of these wonderful physical things, which are also mental at the same time. And as I say, they engage the whole of yourself. Uh, whereas the, you know, the constant pursuit of the stimulation of the cell phone only engages a, a, a fretful part of our attention, never provides us that sense of self-escape, absorption of the flow. So I think that's one reason why Americans are so unhappy. We can add on to it that we need to reform our healthcare system and our uh, many other things. But at the heart of it, I think our educational system, which so overrates the drive towards achievement and so underrates the salubrious wholeness of accomplishment, uh, has a lot to do with it. Do you think we might be forgetting some of the lessons that, that we learned during COVID when, for instance, uh, sourdough starter was hard to find. <laughs> I, yes, Everybody I was think, taking up baking. Baking. I do think that, Fred. And, you know, I'm I'm hesitant to, I want to be delicate in how I articulate that because, of course, many people suffered unduly through the COVID time and they, and people obviously lost family members and a million people, uh, roughly speaking, died. And so I don't want to put too pretty a face on that moment. But yes, for those of us who were lucky enough to escape without serious illness, um, the inward turn of that time was extremely healthy and rewarding. I guess more people read Moby Dick and Marcel Proust in those 18 months than had read uh, Moby Dick and Marcel Proust in the previous 18 years. Um, and a reading of that kind is another example of that kind of accomplishment. We don't read Proust because unless we're stuck in college, we don't read it for uh, a grade, we read it because it's deeply rewarding to us in some way. That's why book groups flourished during the pandemic. I took up, I, I always have loved cooking and wrote a book about philosophy of eating uh, a decade ago, but I really upped my game in uh, during the pandemic. I even invented an entirely new dessert. Uh, so uh, I think that it's true that the pandemic, and, and as you say, baking became a rage. It was one of the backward blessings of the pandemic, and let's put it in the context of backwards blessings, because there were there were many forward things that were troubling. One of the backwards blessings was is that willy nilly we all had to turn back inside in some way, and many people I know, particularly many women I know, found it a uniquely satisfying and salubrious time. You know, even friendships, I suppose, to some extent. Uh became closer to some extent because we, we valued them more, maybe things that we had taken for granted. Yeah, yes, even things like we, we and I now re regret that we don't do it now, we had, I have five brothers and sisters and we had regular uh, Zoom family councils, right? To talk about our parents, to talk to each other, exactly because we couldn't in principle see each other. We wanted to, to see each other. We wanted to be in contact. And now that everybody's back working and, out of the house and racing around, we don't do it, and I and I miss it. So, does this mean that parents should not be pushing their kids so hard on grades in in school and the, the standardized test scores, things like that? What what should we take away from this? I believe that that's true, Fred. I don't want to be a hypocrite about it. I have two kids, and I variously uh, encourage them to do their homework and uh, and empowered them not to do their homework. I, you know, like all parents, I was a living set of uh, contradictions and ambiguities. But in on the whole, I do think that the most important things that we can offer our kids are not the relentless pursuit of achievement, the relentless pursuit of grades and scores and so on, 
but to open the door to accomplishment. I saw it in my own son. I wrote about this in uh, in the real work um, at about the age of 12 or 13, like so many uh, bright uh, kids, particularly bright kids who have, uh, you know, uh, nervous intensity. He became absolutely fascinated by card magic, of all things, mastering the fine art of the classic force and of Di Vernon's triumph, uh, which is kind of the I got rhythm of card magic and so on. And um, the school was not delighted by his concentration on card magic. I'm looking at the beautiful photograph of him as we speak, Fred, oddly enough, at the height of his uh, of his card infatuation uh, that was taken by David Blaine, actually, the magician to whom he became attached. But uh, the school was not crazy about it. That was not how you got into an Ivy League school was by doing card tricks. But he loved it. And he was uniquely empowered, emancipated, absorbed in it. And so I um, gave in. I said, you know what? This is a very positive experience. This is a level of mastery and of um, uh, significance that's worth doing. And we ended up going off to Las Vegas together to meet with magicians so we could see what that whole world was about. Is he going to be a magician now? No, not a bit. He's getting his PhD in philosophy. But I think his ability to, so to speak, match wits with Wittgenstein depends on the confidence that he gained uh, when he was pursuing uh, card magic in the privacy of his room. And I don't regret now having encouraged him to do something that was off track from the main uh, uh, path of ambition of his school, of his friends, uh, because what he got out of it ended up being far more profound. So what what does that mean? I mean, you are not out on tour playing rock music. Your son is not on tour as a musician but you found a sense of accomplishment with, with other yeah. things. And that that is what makes for a happier life, finding something that gives you that? I think so, yes. I, I mean, I think there, it, there are two things that are true, right? I, and I have the bad habit, Fred, of always answering every question by saying there are two things that are part of that. One is, is that, and I think this is true in, in, in every rich life that I'm aware of, only, you know, very spectrum-y people are, maniacally, monomaniacally concentrated on one thing in life. Uh, so I think that having those things, if you, if I could turn to my left here, you would see my stack of guitars, some of which I borrowed from my son, who's a musician as well, um, right over there. You can kind of see them there. Um, but in any case, my point is that uh, those things are satisfying in and of themselves. And I think a rich life has a lot of them. I write in the in the book, in All That Happiness Is, about the power of the secondary passion. And what do I mean by that? Well, I um, in French, in France, where I lived for many years, there's a whole idiom for it. You reference the violin of Angra. Now, Angra was the great neoclassical painter of the 19th century, but his real passion was for playing the violin. Now, he was the greatest painter in France, and nobody says he was even one of the top 100 violinists in France. And yet the the energy and the uh, uh, fire that he took from the violin led him to insist that in the museum dedicated to his memory, the violin and the paintbrush would have equal dignity, equal importance. And I think one of the reasons that that's so powerful is that, as you know, in the things we do well in life, in the accomplishments we pursue as our ambitions, as our vocations, um, there's a kind of a wheel of diminishing return. You know, I, I'm a pretty good writer, but when I sit down to write, and I'm one of the rare writers who loves to write, I don't dread it at all. But when I sit down to write, I have an incredibly high standard for myself that I've been pursuing for half a century now, and that I can never possibly meet, right? And it's true about anybody who's good at anything. You and I may see the scale of their accomplishment. They can only see the scale of their ambition and how meager their accomplishment is compared uh, to their ambition. I, I once had a, a dear friend uh, who's a great winemaker and every, and you would go visit him and taste his wines and think, oh, this is wonderful. And he'd have a sour and sad look on his face because the wine he had in his mind uh, was so far above any wine that he could produce with his, with his hands and on, on his, his ground. Um, he could see only the space between the scale of his ambition and the scale of his accomplishment. And I feel the same way about my writing. I'm sure you feel the same way about your 
work we all do if we're good at anything we see that space and that's one of the reasons why it's so revivifying fred i think so reanimating to pursue a secondary passion because in pursuing that passion we reawaken our power of getting in touch with our basic um, capacity for absorption we get back into the flow you know that it's what psychologists call that beautiful state when you're no longer self-consciously thinking about what you're doing you're just doing it it's the thing that all the zen mystics seek as well and we have access to it through our secondary passions um the, you know that state of of flow that state of absorption is um, an opiate that we can make for ourselves and when we have it running through our veins it gives us additional energy additional inspiration for everything else that we do so i you know people talk about later in life learning fred as though it's kind of a a hobby for the retired and i think that's completely wrong i think that those secondary passions are there to fuel all of ourselves and it can go on and on so you've done so many things and you, you've just mentioned some cooking boxing etc uh anything new since we last spoke <laughs> <laughs> uh, what a good question. Um, I'm just trying to think what um, um, the the thing I should be learning, Fred, and it's on my list of things to learn is singing. Because one of my um, passions, one of my secondary passions, my violin d'angre, my angre violin, is musical theater. And I'm engaged in several musical theater projects. And I am crippled because though I, I play guitar decently and piano a little bit, I can't sing. Now I'm working with you know, significant great composers like Andrew Lippa or David Shire, uh, who do not need me to sing their melodies, but I'd like to be able to express them. And I'm crippled in some ways as a, as a song presenter, uh, because I, I, I don't know how to sing. I, I get uh, frozen when I have to. And so that's something I'm trying to pursue now so I can uh, uh, make my secondary passion more primary. That's exciting. Love that too. So the book again is All That Happiness Is. It arrives in April. Adam Gopnik, congratulations again. And, and thank you so much for spending time with us. It's always a pleasure to be with you, Fred. Now this. It takes a lot of listening to build a better radio. And that's just what the folks at Sea Crane have done. Bob Crane and his crew, nestled among the rivers and tallest trees in the world in Fortuna, California, have made a habit of listening to their customers. And that's just what they've done in building the CC Skywave SSB, the Swiss Army knife of portable radios. For everyday listening to AM or FM in the yard or patio or on the nightstand, without having to drain a mobile phone battery, it's a great companion. But it is also a companion equipped for NOAA weather information and alerts that can be life-saving. You can listen to FEMA and Coast Guard transmissions, too. Beyond all of that, you can tune into shortwave signals from around the world. It's compact, easy to take with you, and built to last. The CC Skywave SSB. Click on the link at textonation.com.